Chapter 13 and 13.1 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Biddy The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 13 How to Do It A Different Way of Organizing the Government as presently configured, the national security institutions of the U.S. government are still the institutions constructed to win the Cold War. The United States confronts a very different world today. Instead of facing a few very dangerous adversaries, the United States confronts a number of less visible challenges that surpass the boundaries of traditional nation-states and call for quick, imaginative and agile responses. The men and women of the World War II generation rose to the challenge of the 1940s and 1950s. They restructured the government so that it could protect the country. That is now the job of the generation that experienced 9-11. Those attacks showed emphatically that ways of doing business rooted in a different era are just not good enough. Americans should not settle for incremental, ad hoc adjustments to a system designed generations ago for a world that no longer exists. We recommend significant changes in the organization of the government. We know that the quality of the people is more important than the quality of the wiring diagrams. Some of the saddest aspects of the 9-11 story are the outstanding efforts of so many individual officials straining, often without success, against the boundaries of the possible. Good people can overcome bad structures. They should not have to. The United States has the resources and the people. The government should combine them more effectively, achieving unity of effort. We offer five major recommendations to do that. 1. Unifying strategic intelligence and operational planning against Islamist terrorists across the foreign domestic divide with the National Counter-Terrorism Center. 2. Unifying the intelligence community with the new National Intelligence Director. 3. Unifying the many participants in the counter-terrorism effort and their knowledge in a network-based information sharing system that transcends traditional governmental boundaries. 4. Unifying and strengthening congressional oversight to improve quality and accountability. And 5. Strengthening the FBI and Homeland Defenders. Chapter 13.1 Unity of Effort Across the Foreign Domestic Divide Much of the public commentary about the 9-11 attacks has dealt with lost opportunities, some of which we reviewed in Chapter 11. These are often characterized as problems of watch-listing, of information sharing, or of connecting the dots. In Chapter 11, we explained that these labels are too narrow. They describe the symptoms, not the disease. In each of our examples, no one was firmly in charge of managing the case and able to draw relevant intelligence from anywhere in the government, assign responsibilities across the agencies, foreign or domestic, track progress, and quickly bring obstacles up to the level where they could be resolved. Responsibility and accountability were diffuse. The agencies cooperated some of the time. But even such cooperation as there was is not the same thing as joint action. When agencies cooperate, one defines the problem and seeks help with it. When they act jointly, the problem and options for action are defined differently from the start. Individuals from different backgrounds come together in analyzing a case and planning how to manage it. In our hearings, we regularly ask witnesses, who is the quarterback? The other players are in their positions, doing their jobs, but who is calling the play that assigns roles to help them execute as a team? Since 9-11, those issues have not been resolved. In some ways joint work has gotten better, and in some ways worse. The effort of fighting terrorism has flooded over many of the usual agency boundaries because of its sheer quantity and energy. Attitudes have changed. Officials are keenly conscious of trying to avoid the mistakes of 9-11. They try to share information. They circulate, even to the President, practically every reported threat, however dubious. 
partly because of all this effort, the challenge of coordinating it has multiplied. Before 9-11, the CIA was plainly the lead agency confronting Al-Qaeda. The FBI played a very secondary role. The engagement of the Departments of Defense and State was more episodic. Today, the CIA is still central, but the FBI is much more active, along with other parts of the Justice Department. The Defense Department effort is now enormous. Three of its unified commands, each headed by a four-star general, have counter-terrorism as a primary mission. Special Operations Command, Central Command, both headquartered in Florida, and Northern Command, headquartered in Colorado. A new Department of Homeland Security combines formidable resources in border and transportation security, along with analysis of domestic vulnerability and other tasks. The State Department has the lead on many of the foreign policy tasks we described in Chapter 12. At the White House, the National Security Council, NSC, now is joined by a parallel presidential advisory structure, the Homeland Security Council. So far we have mentioned two reasons for joint action, the virtue of joint planning and the advantage of having someone in charge to ensure a unified effort. There is a third, the simple shortage of experts with sufficient skills. The limited pool of critical experts, for example, skilled counterterrorism analysts and linguists, is being depleted. Expanding these capabilities will require not just money, but time. Primary responsibility for terrorism analysis has been assigned to the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, TTIC, created in 2003 based at the CIA headquarters but staffed with representatives of many agencies, reporting directly to the Director of the Central Intelligence. Yet the CIA houses another intelligence fusion center, the counter-terrorist center that played such a key role before 9-11. A third major analytic unit is at Defense, in the Defense Intelligence Agency. A fourth, concentrating more on homeland vulnerabilities, is at the Department of Homeland Security. The FBI is in the process of building the analytic capability it has long lacked, and it also has the terrorist screening center. The U.S. government cannot afford so much duplication of effort. There are not enough experienced experts to go around. The duplication also places extra demands on already hard-pressed single-source national technical intelligence collectors like the National Security Agency. Combining Joint Intelligence and Joint Action A smart government would integrate all sources of information to see the enemy as a whole. Integrated all-source analysis should also inform and shape strategies to collect more intelligence. Yet, the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, while it has primary responsibility for terrorism analysis, is formally proscribed from having any oversight or operational authority and is not part of any operational entity other than reporting to the Director of Central Intelligence. The government now tries to handle the problem of joint management, informed by analysis of intelligence from all sources, in two ways. First, Agencies with lead responsibilities for certain problems have constructed their own interagency entities and task forces in order to get cooperation. The counter-terrorist center at CIA, for example, recruits liaison officers from throughout the intelligence community. The military central command has its own interagency center, recruiting liaison officers from all the agencies from which it might need help. The FBI has joint terrorism task forces in 84 locations to coordinate the activities of other agencies when action may be required. Second, the problem of joint operational planning is often passed to the White House, where the NSC staff tries to play this role. The National Security staff at the White House, both NSC and New Homeland Security Council staff, has already become 50% larger since 9-11. But our impression after talking to serving officials is that even this enlarged staff is consumed by meetings on day-to-day -day issues, sifting each day's threat information 
and trying to coordinate everyday operations. Even as it crowds into every square inch of available office space, the NSC staff is still not sized or funded to be an executive agency. In Chapter 3, we described some of the problems that arose in the 1980s, when a White House staff, constitutionally insulated from the usual mechanisms of oversight, became involved in direct operations. During the 1990s, Richard Clark occasionally tried to exercise such authority, sometimes successfully, but often causing friction. Yet a subtler and more serious danger is that as the NSC staff is consumed by these day-to-day -day tasks, it has less capacity to find the time and detachment needed to advise a president on larger policy issues. That means less time to work on major new initiatives, help with legislative management to steer needed bills through Congress, and track the design and implementation of the strategic plans for regions, countries and issues that we discuss in Chapter 12. Much of the job of operational coordination remains with the agencies, especially the CIA. There, DCI Tenet and his chief aides ran interagency meetings nearly every day to coordinate much of the government's day-to-day -day work. The DCI insisted he did not make policy and only oversaw its implementation. In the struggle against terrorism, these distinctions seem increasingly artificial. Also, as the DCI becomes a lead coordinator of the government's operations, it becomes harder to play all the position's other roles, including that of analyst-in-chief. The problem is nearly intractable because of the way the government is currently structured. Lines of operational authority run to the expanding executive departments, and they are guarded for understandable reasons. The DCI commands the CIA's personnel overseas. The Secretary of Defense will not yield to others in conveying commands to military forces. The Justice Department will not give up the responsibility of deciding whether to seek arrest warrants. But the result is that each agency or department needs its own intelligence apparatus to support the performance of its duties. It is hard to break down stovepipes when there are so many stoves that are legally and politically entitled to have cast-iron pipes of their own. Recalling the goldwater nichols legislation of 1986, Secretary Rumsfeld reminded us that to achieve better joint capability, each of the armed services had to give up some of their turf and authorities and prerogatives. Today, he said, the executive branch is stovepiped much like the four services were nearly 20 years ago. He wondered if it might be appropriate to ask agencies to give up some of their existing turf and authority in exchange for a stronger, faster, more efficient government-wide joint effort. Privately, other key officials have made the same point to us. We therefore propose a new institution, a civilian-led unified joint command for counterterrorism. It should combine strategic intelligence and joint operational planning. In the Pentagon's joint staff, which serves the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, intelligence is handled by the J-2 Directorate, operational planning by J-3, and overall policy by J-5. Our concept combines the J-2 and J-3 functions, intelligence and operational planning, in one agency, keeping overall policy coordination where it belongs, in the National Security Council. Recommendation we recommend the establishment of a National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, built on the foundation of the existing Terrorist Threat Integration Center, TTIC. Breaking the older mold of national government organization, this NCTC should be a center for joint operational planning and joint intelligence, staffed by personnel from the various agencies. The head of the NCTC should have authority to evaluate the performance of the people assigned to the center. Such a joint center should be developed in the same spirit that guided the military's creation of unified joint commands or the shaping of earlier national agencies, like the National Reconnaissance Office, which was formed to organize the work of the CIA and several defense agencies in space. 
NCTC Intelligence The NCTC should lead strategic analysis pooling all source intelligence, foreign and domestic, about transnational terrorist organizations with global reach. It should develop net assessments, comparing enemy capabilities and intentions against U.S. defenses and countermeasures. It should also provide warning. It should do this work by drawing on the efforts of the CIA, FBI, Homeland Security and other departments and agencies. It should task collection requirements both inside and outside the United States. The intelligence function, J2, should build on the existing TTIC structure and remain distinct as a national intelligence center within the NCTC, as the government's principal knowledge bank on Islamist terrorism, with the main responsibility for strategic analysis and net assessment, it should absorb a significant portion of the analytical talent now residing in the CIA's Counter-Terrorist Center and the DIA's Joint Intelligence Task Force Combating Terrorism, JITF-CT. NCTC Operations The NCTC should perform joint planning the plans would assign operational responsibilities to lead agencies, such as State, the CIA, the FBI, Defense and its combatant commands, Homeland Security and other agencies. The NCTC should not direct the actual execution of these operations, leaving that job to the agencies. The NCTC would then track implementation it would look across the foreign domestic divide and across agency boundaries, updating plans to follow through on cases. The Joint Operational Planning Function, J3, will be new to the TTIC structure. The NCTC can draw on analogous work now being done in the CIA and every other involved department of the government as well as reaching out to knowledgeable officials in state and local agencies throughout the United States. The NCTC should not be a policy-making body. Its operations and planning should follow the policy direction of the President and the National Security Council. Consider this hypothetical case. The NSA discovers that a suspected terrorist is traveling to Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur. The NCTC should draw on joint intelligence resources, including its own NSA counter-terrorism experts, to analyze the identities and possible destinations of these individuals. Informed by this analysis, the NCTC would then organize and plan the management of the case, drawing on the talents and differing kinds of experience among the several agency representatives assigned to it assigning tasks to the CIA overseas, to Homeland Security watching entry points into the United States, and to the FBI. If military assistance might be needed, the Special Operations Command could be asked to develop an appropriate concept for such an operation. The NCTC would be accountable for tracking the progress of the case, ensuring that the plan evolved with it, and integrating the information into a warning. The NCTC would be responsible for being sure that intelligence gathered from the activities in the field became part of the government's institutional memory about Islamist terrorist personalities, organizations and possible means of attack. In each case, the involved agency would make its own senior managers aware of what it was being asked to do. If those agency heads objected and the issue could not easily be resolved, then the disagreement about roles and missions could be brought before the National Security Council and the President. NCTC Authorities The head of the NCTC should be appointed by the President and should be equivalent in rank to a Deputy Head of Cabinet Department. The head of the NCTC would report to the National Intelligence Director, an office whose creation we recommend below placed in the executive office of the President. The head of the NCTC would thus also report indirectly to the President. This official's nomination should be confirmed by the Senate, and he or she should testify to the Congress, as is the case now with other statutory presidential offices, like the U.S. Trade Representative.
to avoid the fate of other entities with great nominal authority and little real power the head of the nctc must have the right to concur in the choices of personnel to lead the operating entities of the departments and agencies focused on counterterrorism specifically including the head of the counterterrorist center the head of the fbi's counterterrorism division the commanders of the Defense Department's Special Operations Command and Northern Command and the State Department's Coordinator for Counterterrorism. The head of the NCTC should also work with the Director of the Office of Management and Budget in developing the President's counterterrorism budget. There are precedents for surrendering authority for joint planning while preserving an agency's operational control. In the international context, NATO commanders may get line authority over forces assigned by other nations. In U.S. Unified Commands, commanders plan operations that may involve units belonging to one of the services. In each case, procedures are worked out, formal and informal, to define the limits of the joint commander's authority. The most serious disadvantage of the NCTC is the reverse of its greatest virtue. The struggle against Islamist terrorism is so important that any clear-cut centralization of authority to manage and be accountable for it may concentrate too much power in one place. The proposed NCTC would be given the authority of planning the activities of other agencies. Law or executive order must define the scope of such line authority. The NCTC would not eliminate interagency policy disputes. These would still go to the National Security Council. To improve coordination at the White House, we believe the existing Homeland Security Council should soon be merged into a single National Security Council. The creation of the NCTC should help the NSC staff concentrate on its core duties of assisting the President and supporting interdepartmental policy making. We recognize that this is a new and difficult idea precisely because the authorities we recommend for the NCTC really would, as Secretary Rumsfeld foresaw, ask strong agencies to give up some of their turf and authority in exchange for a stronger, faster, more efficient government-wide joint effort. Countering transnational Islamist terrorism will test whether the U.S. government can fashion more flexible models of management needed to deal with the 21st century world. An argument against change is that the nation is at war and cannot afford to reorganize in midstream. But some of the main innovations of the 1940s and 1950s, including the creation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and even the construction of the Pentagon itself, were undertaken in the midst of war. Surely the country cannot wait until the struggle against Islamist terrorism is over. Surprise, when it happens to a government, is likely to be a complicated, diffuse, bureaucratic thing. It includes neglect of responsibility, but also responsibility so poorly defined or so ambiguously delegated that action gets lost. That comment was made more than 40 years ago about Pearl Harbor. We hope another commission, writing in the future about another attack, does not again find this quotation to be so apt. End of chapter 13.1 Recording by Biddy